At this school, we do the three IB curriculum. So we do the primary years um, program and we do the middle years program because we feel those are the best um, uh, training and preparation for the IB diploma program. We're not going to focus so much on those first two programs this evening, although there will be quite a few people around the room um, who will be able to answer any questions you have about the IB PYP and the IB MYP. We're going to focus on the diploma program this evening. Um, so for those who have children that are a bit lower down, um, feel free to ask questions about the other programs. But um, this evening really is a bit more about the diploma program and how it's going to prepare students throughout school and into university for um, life. And so we have uh, very, we've been very fortunate this evening to have two eminent speakers, um, Jeffrey Beard and Jeffrey Petty, who um, you will see from your table. You have a little flyer that will tell you all about them. And we're really um, pleased to have them. We also have staff and students. Um, who will be um, talking eloquently about the IB. I'm particularly pleased about our student who will be talking about the IB because she's learned so much in just a few months. So welcome and enjoy this evening. And what I'm going to do tonight is talk to you a little bit about a broad brush uh, approach for what the IB is all about. Um, to do that, I'm going to lay some context around education systems in general. Each country, each nation has their own education system. And for the most part, they aren't working very well. <clears throat> and so part of uh, one of the reasons you're here tonight is that you inherently recognize some of this and you are consciously looking for alternatives for your children to be more successful in life, to get into a good university and a good career beyond that. So there's uh, been no secret that uh, many nation states, almost all of them, uh, have issues with their education systems. And even private education systems that are out there Cambridge and Advanced Placement, College Board, have their limitations because they are certainly different. And to think of them all in the same bucket is, is not really uh, appropriate. One of my favorite authors is Tom Friedman. He wrote a book uh, in the early part of uh, after 2000 called The World is Flat. And I really mm -hmm. resonated with his concepts. And he basically painted a picture which for me was, was fairly accurate. He says, you know, the jobs are really going to go to the best educated workforce. This is a flat world. Borders are becoming transnational. The ability of citizens to, to be educated and work in a different country uh, really is what the future is all about. And you, of course, you experience this. Whenever you call a call center, you're not sure. Uh, it used to be just down the road or within the same city or within the same country. Now you're talking to somebody from India or Pakistan or you're not sure where it is. But he says this triple convergence of new players on a new playing field uh, creating new processes for international collaboration, horizontal collaboration, will be the most important force shaping the global economies and politics for the 21st century. So this flat world is bringing people together, and so you're forced to interact and understand, which is one of the reasons Dan talked about uh, uh, open-mindedness and understanding of different cultures. So let's talk about what fit-for-purpose skills in the 21st century are, because whenever I talk about global citizenship skills or global for 21st century skills, people say, well, what is it that you need? And there's, quite frankly, a number of different def definitions, but they all tend to resonate around some of the same themes. Uh, they tend to be things around creativity, innovation, the use, use of uh, uh, ideas and abstractions, self-discipline, the ability to manage one's own time, and having that as, a, as an attribute. Leadership, communication, and ability to, well, to function well as part of a team. It's not important anymore that you are individually competent. You have to be able to work with others. You have to be able to collaborate. So many of these uh, uh, studies have also provided blueprints for educational reform. They say these are the types of things that schools need to do if they're going to be successful in meeting the public's needs in the future. The view is that the IB programs are already doing this. The IB programs were constructed in a way to bring these concepts together and embed them in students in terms of behaviors and in terms of um, uh, their ability to think critically, to be internationally minded. And so um, IB programs, uh, no matter which program, will have this attribute built in. The IB has a learner profile. So some of the things you saw in the videos that were running before the show, some of the attributes you see here, but there also are a state of attributes that IB asks all schools to embed in their educational philosophy. And it basically says, I'll read them for the others in the back, IB learners, we strive to be inquirers, knowledgeable, thinkers, communicators, principled, open-minded, caring, risk-takers, balanced, and reflective. 
As you walk around the school, you'll tend to see these attributes on the classroom walls. You'll tend to hear students uh, talk about these things. They know them, they understand them, and they've embedded them in their own learning. So the primary year program focuses on students to think critically. It takes um, works on collaboration, reflection, multiple perspectives, and taking action, and as Audrey indicated, constructing meaning from, from how things work. But it's all context in terms of why is this important, not exactly what it is. Middle year program is also one that's it's aimed at age 12 to 16, so it's those uh, uh, troublesome years when they enter their teens. Now again, dealing with concepts and big ideas, uh, community service, context uh, is, is brought into this. So they, they are developing more of the critical thinking skills during this particular phase. Again, preparing them for uh, the diploma program later on, which is uh, age 17, uh, uh, 16 to 18. The uh, diploma program, this is the grid that Dan showed you here, uh, gets into a different context, whereas the primary program and the middle year program are frameworks. They basically can fit it across any school curriculum. So um, any school can implement them, every school is, you know, has their subject matters, but it basically fits on top of it. And they're designed to be whole school programs. So in some of the schools, um, they break out the IB program. Some kids will do the IB, other kids will do uh, another program. With the primary and middle year program, they're designed to be whole school programs that incorporate everybody's. The diploma program is a little bit different. It is subject specific in terms of having uh, curriculum developed for each of the particular subjects, um, as well as the attributes that Dan described in terms of the CAS component, the uh, 4,000 word extended essay, and the um, TOK class. Uh, this is the time that the students are really developing these international mindedness skills, these critical thinking skills. They're doing the 4,000 word extended essay. They're preparing themselves for university. And their assessment is rigorous. So besides the informative assessment that occurs in the classroom, there's a summative assessment that occurs at the end of the two years. So the students go for two years, learn the subject over a two year period. And um, I think about a DNA strand that sort of wraps around. It continues to, con to wrap around and, and build on the knowledge. And it's capped by a summative assessment examination that is the same exam given to all students around the world on the same day on the same subject. Logistically, it's a nightmare to do that, but it really uh, works well. And it's one of the things that universities love about the IB because they're all taking at the end the same sum of assessment. Let's talk about university because our next speaker is gonna talk about a little bit about what difference does it make with an IB university. And a lot of your motivation for putting your children in, a, uh, in an IB school is, I want them to be successful in life, but I'd like them to get into a good university. They're university bound. Do they have a better chance? The answer is absolutely yes. So I'm showing some rates here, of graduation rates. And <clears throat> for those in the back, it basically says, look, if you're an IB diploma graduate, you're more likely, 64% to 36%, to finish your four-year education, university education, bachelor's degree in four years. And uh, you're probably 81% certain to get it done within six years versus 57. So uh, if you're an IB graduate, you will finish university sooner. Uh, you tend to be accepted uh, better. In the UK, where you're competing against A-levels, they find that IB graduates tend to get first-class honors. They tend to go on to a higher education. They tend to go on to better careers. They tend to earn more. Um, so there's lots of evidence that IB graduation, uh, IB graduates do quite well. The number of schools that do three programs, like you find here, is uh, is very little. It's less than 200 schools around the world. So this is quite a unique school. Uh, you would find other IB schools within um, Switzerland. Uh, many offer the diploma program. There's only a handful that offer the full uh, IB continuum. Higher education is catching up to the IB. That's my view as a professor in higher education. And let me explain why. For too many years, in fact, most of you sitting around the tables probably went to universities where the professors, quite frankly, were the most important. Research was king or queen, depending on how you want to look at it. And that's how the school measured their performance. Research still matters. But fortunately, because 
higher education is under a lot of competition from globalization, from technology, from stakeholders who say research is important, but why is it relevant, or is it relevant? Universities and colleges are on the road of having to change. And that's what I want to explain to you tonight. How are we teaching, what are we teaching, and to whom are we teaching it, or ideally, who would we like to teach it to? And that's where I believe the IB actually puts your, your children in the best position to find the right fit. Because I don't like it when people say elite universities. My child shouldn't go to certain universities. I already know this based on her personality. It's about fit. And the IB, I believe, is preparing students to fit with many, many more universities than they did 10, 15 years ago. Fundamentals are great. Students know what they can do, meaning they understand math, they understand a language, they understand something in science. But capabilities and values, that's what we're looking for when we're interviewing students. And this is not coming from the schools. This is one of the things coming from the accreditation bodies around the world. And we, they, well, I'm not talking Swiss, I'm talking international accreditation. They're saying you can teach children certain things, especially at the university level, but do they know what they can do with it? And do they care? So values and capabilities, the students who come to the universities and understand what they, not specifically what they want to do, but what they believe they might be able to do, hence that's why they're choosing the courses they're doing, and they actually understand why it's important to them. They're the ones who we want to fit in our organizations, and I'm saying we globally as professors and administrators, because they fit with our culture. Some students' values, when I interview them, or the capabilities they want to develop, I'll tell them, you need to go to EPFL, because UNEAL is not the right place. And I taught at EPFL for five years. So I can tell them, I don't think you should come to our program. I think you should go to EPFL, because they're more in line with your value system, and they can help you develop the capabilities. The nice thing I see with the students coming from the IB, they can articulate this. And if you can articulate it during the interview, trust me, that's much more important than this fundamental. The nice thing about the IB, which I've seen, which is actually what drew us to the IB program, not just because I'm an advocate of entrepreneurship, is because it allows the students to do things their way. Yes, there's an exam, but the path to that exam isn't necessarily the same. That's the entrepreneurial, innovative approach. And universities, I'm working with China right now, a couple different universities, they are truly embracing this. America's been doing it for many years, and Europe, the European Commission is spending a lot of our tax money pushing this. And I can guarantee you, everybody in this room, if you have a child, at least, well, any child, could be two years old, in their lifetime, by the time they graduate university, this will still be an initiative, because I know the timeline. These things are 30 years long, the timelines that they're looking to keep the entrepreneurial mindset going. So the nice thing about here, the IB is setting them up for what universities are looking for. The beauty of having a student who comes from an IB program is we don't have to train them to engage. They've been engaging. My daughter's 10. She comes home and tells me about why we should be engaging in the community and how we could be engaging. And her definition of community might be smaller than mine, but it doesn't matter. It's about engagement. It's about applying those skills in a way. And I actually think more importantly, now our students are all forced to think about the impact. The new thing, and I'll say there are a minority of us around the world embracing it, but there are more and more schools requiring it, is experiential learning or the flipped classroom. At higher education, we're calling it the flipped classroom. In the IB, they call it the classroom. Because the teacher is there to share knowledge and to engage with people. The students are there to experience it, not just memorize. Not memorize, take a test and say I've done well. Not all work on the exact same topic the exact same way. The experiential part. In my class, I have people playing with marshmallows, building airplane, uh, paper airplanes. We do all different types of games. We do things, some of my students look at me and say, and the purpose of this, I'm like, give me three hours, you'll figure it out. And in the end, they all figure it out. The IB student, in my opinion, is learning about embracing learning because the higher education, as much as we love to teach people forever, because we, I produce research, I want to teach people my research. Unfortunately, I have to engage, well, fortunately, actually, not for me, it's very fortunate. For some people, it's unfortunate. But the future of higher education is simple. 
Our job is to engage people in what we're doing with our research. So it's still in the classroom, but we need to engage them into embracing wanting to learn about what I'm studying and what I'm teaching them. But they need to learn it on their terms and collectively and collaboratively, we achieve the learning objective. But if I have 35 students, I'll probably have at least 25 different ways of getting there. And this here, you know, this little phrase here is what, how I sum up how the IB is helping students going forward into higher education. Because they come in not wanting to be taught, not wanting to be told, they're actually there wanting to learn and figure out what they don't know. And if they don't know it, how can they learn it better? And how can they work with you? Uh, I'm in my first year of the DP, which makes me 16 years old. And a little bit, a little bit about myself. I am South African. I was born in South Africa. I am also Austrian and Slovakian. Um, like I said, I was born in South Africa and lived there until I was four. The age of four, picked up, moved to Europe, came to Switzerland, and I've lived here ever since. So a little bit about my schooling history. My first school was in South Africa, but I mean, I was so young that I don't really remember much of it. But when we came to Switzerland, my parents put me into the public school, which is the norm. It's usually what you tend to do when you move to a new country. And both my parents had been to public school, so they just thought, why not? So I was in public school for almost a decade. I was there for nine years of my life. When suddenly, at age 13, my parents came to me and said, Danielle, what do you think about changing schools? But um, you can imagine that as a 13-year-old going into a new school, I was scared. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. I had seen all these scary videos about what the IB was like, and I was completely different to what I was used to. I was also shy because, I mean, everybody here knows stepping out of your comfort zone is not the funnest thing to do. It's not fun to do something you've never done before and just dip your toes in the pool. No, I had to dive into the pool and just experience it for what it was. I was also annoyed, <laughs> annoyed with my parents for putting me through this, but, sorry, <laughs> annoyed with my parents for putting me through this, but I quickly realized that it was something that was honestly one of the best things that they've ever forced me to do. Um, I came across a quote that really symbolizes my experience. It's by Oscar Wilde and it says, what seems to us as bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. Now for me, this was, 100% completely true. Now, coming to the school, I was amazed, amazed at everything. I walked into class and everything that I thought I knew about school was wrong, was completely different, and teaching here was taught in such a different way that I didn't to be honest, know what to do with myself. Um, here, compared to my previous school, you are taught to look at things from different perspectives. You're not taught to look at things as the big picture. You're taught to look at these little details in the picture and how they fuse together to make a bigger picture. And that's something that really shocked me because I wasn't used to looking at things from so many points of views and all these angles kind of scared me. I was also in awe at the support I was receiving from my teachers, from my peers, from the general school community. I mean, our principal, from the day I came to the school, stands outside every single morning, snow, rain, wind, tornado, she is always there saying good morning to us, and that just really, really symbolizes and portrays the type of school that I'm in. Um, in my previous school, I didn't have the best experiences with teachers and them being caring and supportive towards me. Um, I wasn't urged to be the best person and best student I could be the same way I am here. Here, walking into my very first math class with Mr. Piercy in grade nine, the first or one of the first things he said to us was, okay, in my class, I don't care about mistakes. Mistakes are one of my favorite things. I think that you can learn so much from your mistakes and I celebrate your mistakes. So don't be afraid to make mistakes, ask questions, and just, I mean, get on with the work, but ask your questions. And that for me was just one of the biggest things that made the difference between 
my previous school and the school I'm in now. Now, although we do have a lot of work, it's work that I actually enjoy doing. I'm someone who loves learning. I love getting new knowledge and building these foundations where I can just put on more knowledge and more knowledge and more knowledge and just reference back to these layers of knowledge I have. And coming to this school, this is exactly what we do. We build and build and build and build and we do that independently, which is something that's also very, very um, attributed to the IV system. You learn independently rather than being completely codependent and dependent on your teachers. It's not your teachers telling you exactly what to do, what steps to follow, what to memorize. It's not that at all. Your teachers give you the bare necessities. They give you a few little bits and bobs. And with those bits and bobs, you have to inquire. You have to delve deep and make something. And the shocking thing for me was that whatever I made, the teachers, I won't say loved because, you know, some things I didn't do amazingly, but they celebrated it because they didn't care what I did as long as I <clears throat> did it. And I did it with perseverance and I inquired and got on with it. So I went from looking like this to essentially looking like this. <laughs> When you're writing those reflections, it's not the funnest thing, I'm not going to lie. But looking back at it now, it really has impacted the way I look at things. I look at things for what I have achieved and for what I have learned rather than, okay, I did that, let's move on. I take in the knowledge, I accept it, I absorb it, and that's what the reflective learner profile is really all about. Um, I became more knowledgeable, knowledgeable because, I mean, it's hard not to become more knowledgeable when you're exposed to so many different ways of learning, so many different subjects and situations and cases that it's really difficult to not absorb everything that's kind of being thrown at you. So I've become more knowledgeable. I've become more of a thinker, a thinker because, again, I'm not asked to look at things for the big picture. I'm asked to look at things for how they come together to make the bigger picture. I'm asked to look at things and look at them from a completely different view. By nature, I'm already quite a caring person. But coming to the school, I realized that being caring is something that should be a part of everyone. In my previous school, I wasn't really exposed to teachers and even students that would be caring towards me. I thought that being caring was just like a personality trait or a physical characteristic. Oh, she has blue eyes. Oh, she has brown hair. Oh, she's caring. But no, coming to the school, I realized that being caring is something that you should strive to be. It's something that should be a part of you. And it's not something that you should can take lightly. It's something that you need to incorporate into your daily lives because how are you gonna move forward if you can't care for the people around you? To be honest with you, I'm 16 and I don't know what's next for me. I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know what university I'm going to go to. I don't even know what I want to do. But I am confident, 100% confident, that with everything that I am exposed to in this school, in the IB, in the DP, that whatever I choose to do, I will succeed because of my, my schooling here. Thank you.